Hello everyone, welcome to True Crime Inspector. In today's episode, we're diving into another unsettling and perplexing case. Several years back, the heart-wrenching case of young Tylee Palmer sent shockwaves across Australia, a tale marked by its extreme brutality and a series of tragic coincidences. In an unfortunate twist of fate, Tylee, born into a dysfunctional family, ended up in the care of another family, one that proved to be even more horrific and abusive. Her biological mother, in an effort to shield her daughter from an abusive husband, transferred Tylee to another family with the best of intentions. Tragically, this decision led to Tylee facing an even graver danger. Tylee Alicia Rose Palmer was born in Logan City, Queensland, a small town in Australia in April 2003. Regrettably, her childhood was marred by less than ideal circumstances. Her father was known for his heavy drinking, hot temper, and aggressive behavior. He frequently assaulted his wife in Tylee's presence and sometimes directed his violence towards his daughter. Living in constant stress, fear, and oppression was the norm for young Tylee. It's no wonder that she began to habitually run away from home eager to escape the endless parental arguments and her father's wrath. The reasons behind her mother Cynthia Palmer's decision to stay with her abusive husband are speculative. However, Cynthia, perhaps feeling trapped by her own circumstances, chose to hand her daughter over to another family, believing it would provide a better life for Tylee. Cynthia later expressed regret over this decision, viewing it as a necessary but painful choice given her situation. Neighborhood gossip presents an alternative narrative. Some suggest that Cynthia herself struggled with alcoholism, and despite attempts at rehabilitation, overcoming the addiction proved challenging. This came to a head when Tylee was found wandering the streets on the opposite side of the city after one of her escapes, drawing the attention of Child Protection Services. When these officials visited the Palmer residence and offered assistance, Cynthia agreed to have Tylee placed in a foster home. Given the toxic environment in which she was raised, Tylee grew into a troubled teenager with a challenging disposition. Consequently, finding a suitable foster family for her was a complex task. Tylee's rebellious behavior, including running away, loitering, and begging on the streets, made her a difficult charge. She did not obey her guardians and insisted on doing things her way. She didn't stay with her first two foster families for long, as they found it hard to manage her behavior. Tylee longed for the stability and warmth of a family home, yet her concept of a harmonious household was unclear. This disconnect often led to conflicts with her foster families, culminating in Tylee running away. Then, in early 2015, it seemed that an ideal foster family had emerged for Tylee in the form of the Thorburns, who appeared ready to embrace her wholeheartedly. The Thorburn family comprised Rick and Julia Thorburn and their two sons, 19-year-old Josh and 18-year-old Trent. They resided in a spacious two-story house equipped with a swimming pool nestled in a quaint rural area near Brisbane. Owning a horse farm, Julia also operated a private kindergarten at their home, which garnered considerable popularity among local parents who trusted their children in the Thorburn's care. This family was seen as affluent, respectable, and had a good reputation in their community. Notably, they expressed a willingness to take in a troubled teenager like Tylee, a rarity among foster families. Child Protective Services deemed the Thorburn household as the most suitable environment for Tylee, and in January, she moved in with them. Initially, Tylee's stay followed a familiar pattern. She rebelled, refused to settle down, and ran away multiple times, only to be returned by child welfare services. However, as time passed, she seemed to adjust, accept her new family, and form a bond with them. But beneath this veneer of normalcy lay a hidden drama that soon escalated into a devastating tragedy, the mysterious disappearance of Tylee. She attended a local school a few kilometers from her foster home, with Rick Thorburn regularly transporting her to and from school. Tylee made many friends at her new school, who described her as kind, cheerful, and friendly. 
despite these connections, she still harbored a desire to return to her biological family, maintaining contact with her mother and grandmother. Tylee had occasionally expressed feelings of discomfort and even fear, though she never elaborated on what specifically caused these feelings. On the morning of October 30th, 2015, Rick Thorburn followed his routine of driving Tylee to school. After dropping her off, he returned home to attend to his daily chores. However, he soon received a call notifying him that Tylee hadn't shown up for her classes. While concern was initially minimal due to Tylee's history of running away, she typically returned by the evening or the next day. The Thorburns promptly reported Tylee's absence to the police, and the search for the missing girl commenced almost immediately. The family members actively cooperated with the investigation, insisting that there had been no recent conflicts with Tylee that might have triggered her to run away. On the contrary, they claimed she had been in good spirits and seemed content. Rick Thorburn maintained that he had dropped Tylee off at school as usual, then returned home to care for the horses, only learning of her absence after a call from a teacher. His wife and sons verified his account. In a bid to aid the search, the Thorburns established a social media page dedicated to finding Tylee. The page featured her photos, details about her disappearance, and a description of what she was wearing that day. They urged anyone with information about Tylee's whereabouts to contact them or the police. However, no helpful leads were received. The police also conducted a thorough search of the Thorburn family's home and property, but found nothing to arouse suspicion or indicate foul play. The foster parents' seemingly composed demeanor raised some eyebrows, but there was no concrete evidence to implicate them in any wrongdoing. As the search for Tylee continued, many concerned individuals joined the effort, deeply invested in the girl's well-being. Volunteers scoured the area, distributed flyers with Tylee's photo, and questioned locals, all in hopes of uncovering any valuable leads. A week into the search, a grim discovery was made along the banks of the Pimpama River. Two fishermen, who had set out for a routine day of fishing on November 5th, stumbled upon a horrifying sight. Initially there to cast their fishing lines, they noticed something unusual in the swampy shallows. Approaching the object, they were shocked to find it was human remains. The police, upon arriving at the scene, observed that the body was that of a small statured individual, but it was so badly mutilated that determining even the gender was challenging. The body was unclothed, and no personal effects were found in the vicinity. The remains bore numerous injuries, initially thought to be inflicted by local wildlife. Further compounding the situation, the body's advanced state of decomposition, exacerbated by heat, humidity, and insects drawn by the odor, made identification difficult. The remains were sent for forensic examination, where experts concluded it belonged to a female, likely aged between 12 and 16 years. Police then cross-referenced the details with recent missing persons reports and soon identified the body as that of Tylee Palmer, the girl whose disappearance had galvanized the city's search efforts. Due to the prolonged immersion in water, pinpointing the exact cause of death was challenging. However, forensic experts speculated that Tylee had likely died from asphyxiation, evidenced by the crushed state of her hyoid bone. The most chilling aspect of the case emerged when investigators realized that the injuries on Tylee's body, initially thought to be animal bites, might have been inflicted by a person, possibly even before her death. This revelation steered the case unmistakably towards a criminal investigation. A murder case was promptly opened, but progress was slow. With no substantial leads to follow, the investigation risked becoming protracted, potentially spanning months or years, or even joining the ranks of unsolved crimes. The case quickly captured public attention, and the community deeply mourned Tylee's death. To pay their respects, nearly a quarter of the city's population attended the memorial service, bringing flowers, soft toys, and balloons. On November 14th, Tylee's body was cremated. In a series of interviews with the media, Tylee's biological mother pointedly accused Child Protective Services of criminal negligence 
that in her view led to her daughter's tragic demise. Meanwhile, the behavior of the Thorburn Foster family, despite their initial cooperation with the investigation, began to raise suspicions. Rick Thorburn was the last person reportedly to have seen Tylee alive, but there was no independent verification that he actually took his foster daughter to school on the morning of October 30th. His wife and sons claimed they saw Tylee enter the car. Surveillance footage along the route to the school did show the vehicle heading in that direction, but crucially, there was no video evidence of Tylee exiting the car at the school. No teachers or fellow students reported seeing Tylee at school or on the school grounds that day. This absence cast doubt on whether she was ever in the car that morning. While the Thorburn family's accounts of the day's events occasionally diverged, they maintained that the day proceeded as usual with no signs of impending trouble. As the investigation unfolded, numerous schoolmates and friends of Tylee were interviewed. They all spoke positively of her, but noted that she seemed troubled by something she either couldn't or was too afraid to disclose. In the days leading up to the tragedy, Tylee had sought refuge with a classmate, claiming she was in danger and feared her guardians would kill her. Her friend, though sympathetic, could not accommodate her request for a sleepover without parental permission, and thus Tylee's plea was not taken seriously. Another revelation came from a peer who shared that Tylee had confided in her about a romantic involvement with the Thorburn's younger son, Trent, who was 18 at the time. Tylee even boasted about their alleged relationship and future plans together. This claim seemed dubious as Tylee was only 12 years old and such a relationship, particularly with an older, albeit adopted, brother, appeared improbable and more akin to a child's fantasy. However, the investigators had to pursue this lead. The Thorburn family fiercely denied any such allegations. They portrayed Tylee as a liar seeking attention and suggested that her school friends might have fabricated or fantasized these stories. With no concrete evidence linking the Thorburns to any wrongdoing towards Tylee, they remained free and continued their lives, their private kindergarten still in operation. Despite the tragedy, life at the Thorburn farm continued to thrive, seemingly unaffected by the loss. For months, the investigation stagnated, cycling through the same leads without progress. Authorities interrogated local residents with criminal records and re-examined individuals previously suspected of similar crimes. Yet, these efforts bore no fruit, and the promise of a substantial reward for information relevant to the case failed to catalyze any breakthroughs. Parallel to these efforts, a search was conducted in the vicinity where Tylee's body was discovered. A month later, investigators found a backpack and a shoe buried under silt, approximately 150 meters from where the body was located. These items, suspected to belong to Tylee, seemed deliberately concealed, as if someone had intended for them to never be found. The case gained significant public attention, sparking widespread outcry and demands for justice. The case was covered extensively by the media, with updates broadcast on television and published in newspapers. The city's residents, led at times by Tylee's biological mother, organized demonstrations calling for the apprehension and punishment of the responsible party or parties. In an effort to break the case wide open, the police extended an offer of protection and immunity to any accomplices who came forward with information about the perpetrator. However, this plea also met with silence. As six months passed, no new leads or investigative avenues emerged, leaving the case at a standstill. Then a pivotal moment occurred. An anonymous call was received, and a decision was made to wiretap the Thorburn household, potentially opening a new chapter in the investigation. In the summer of 2016, a pivotal anonymous phone call steered the investigation in a new direction. The caller suggested the Thorburns had ulterior motives for fostering a troubled teen like Tylee. They were supposedly enticed by the higher allowances paid for the care of challenging children. The informant also hinted at a possible intimate relationship between Tylee and Trent, the Thorburn's youngest son, a rumor that had been mentioned earlier by one of Tylee's school friends. 
While this could have been mere hearsay, detectives recalled the similar whispers they had heard before and decided to scrutinize Trent more closely. Despite thorough interrogations, the Thorburn family remained steadfast in their denial, maintaining that Tylee had simply run away and subsequently met with misfortune. A discreet examination of the family's social media profiles unearthed intriguing details. In a chat conversation discovered on Trent's profile, he had mentioned about six weeks prior to Tylee's tragedy, engaging in a sexual encounter with a much younger girl, though he didn't reveal her identity. While this social media exchange wasn't conclusive evidence, it was enough for the police to secure authorization for covert surveillance inside the Thorburn residence. The wiretaps installed soon began to unravel the family's carefully crafted facade. Recordings from the wiretaps revealed the family members meticulously aligning their stories, ensuring their accounts matched in every detail. Rick Thorburn was heard instructing his family on what to say and how to act. Julia Thorburn was caught saying phrases like, Dad made this decision to save us. We'll have to live with it. Never tell anyone or anything, no matter what happens. Rick's threats to his family were also captured, revealing a climate of fear within the household, where everyone knew Rick could turn violent at any moment. Although these recordings didn't provide direct evidence of murder, they raised significant red flags. As a result, the Thorburns' blue card, which authorized them to work with children, was revoked, leading to the closure of their private kindergarten. The wiretaps also confirmed the intimate relationship between Trent and Tylee. The disturbing revelations continued to unfold. Trent confessed that his relationship with Tylee had been ongoing for several months, and in October, he expressed concerns to his mother that Tylee might be pregnant. Such a situation posed a serious legal risk for Trent, given the illicit nature of their relationship. Upon learning this, Julia disclosed everything to Rick, who then decided to take drastic action. On the day of the tragedy, Julia and her sons left for Brisbane early in the morning purportedly for business purposes. This departure was strategically planned to create an alibi for them. Meanwhile, Rick remained at home with Tylee. By the time Julia and her sons returned in the evening, Tylee was reported missing. Rick ominously claimed to have solved the problem, though he didn't elaborate on what he meant. Given the new information from the wiretaps, the police decided to re-interview all family members and also to inspect Rick's car, which he was believed to have used to drive Tylee to school on the day she disappeared. Investigators discovered that the car had been sold shortly after Tylee's disappearance. When they located and thoroughly examined the vehicle, they found old, washed-out blood traces in the trunk. DNA analysis ultimately determined that the blood discovered belonged to the victim, Tylee. This revelation left no room for doubt, leading to the immediate arrest of the Thorburns. Upon their apprehension, they were interrogated separately, with Trent being the first to provide his account. As it unfolded, Trent had manipulated Tylee into a deceptive relationship, feigning deep affection and a promise of eternal togetherness. Tylee, genuinely enamored by him, fell for his ruse and even shared the details of their supposed romance with her school friends. However, as suspicions arose concerning her pregnancy, she began to fear that her foster father could pose a genuine threat to her life. Consequently, she reached out to classmates, seeking refuge, even if only temporarily. Rick resisted the longest, but the weight of evidence and testimonies from his own family members eventually led him to confess. He admitted to strangling Tylee and attempting to conceal her identity by disfiguring her remains, all in a desperate bid to avoid detection. Surprisingly, the prospect of DNA testing had eluded Rick's considerations. Upon the formal charge of first-degree murder, he suffered a heart attack and collapsed, necessitating immediate hospitalization. Medical professionals later determined that he had intentionally induced the heart attack by ingesting a substantial quantity of potent drugs. They fought vigorously for his life for several days, ensuring that the perpetrator could stand trial and face the consequences of his actions. 
The trial and subsequent sentencing of each member of the Thorburn family gripped the entire nation as the Tylee Palmer case emerged as one of the most sensational and brutal in the past decade. Every member of the Thorburn clan was found guilty, though many believed their sentences were too lenient. For instance, the eldest son, Josh, received a mere three-month prison term for perjury and attempting to hinder the investigation. The court considered Josh's genuine remorse and the fact that he played a pivotal role as a key witness against his father and younger brother during the trial. Julia Thorburn, on the other hand, was sentenced to a year and a half behind bars for perjury and aiding her husband and son. During the trial, she admitted to being in great fear of her spouse, believing that he could potentially harm her and her sons as well. The youngest brother faced a four-year prison sentence, which many deemed too lenient for his role in enticing Tylee, committing perjury, and obstructing the investigation. In reality, he served just over a year before being granted early release. Rick, responsible for the most heinous actions against Tylee, received a life sentence. He willingly pleaded guilty to all charges, expressing deep remorse for his actions. Rick consistently claimed that his actions were driven by a misguided desire to protect his family, struggling to comprehend how he could commit such a heinous crime. Following the final verdict, Tylee's biological mother gave an interview where she conveyed that none of the punishments meted out to her daughter's killers could ever be deemed severe enough. However, the day of the verdict marked the conclusion of her relentless quest for justice. Thank you for joining us today. Please subscribe to our channel and remember to hit the notification bell so you won't miss any of our upcoming true crime stories from around the world.